Bobby earned his joint MBA from the Kellogg School of Management, Northwest University, and the Schulich School of Business, York University. He also has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Waterloo and spent some time studying cross-cultural management in Hong Kong and Germany. That's great. Bobby is also an experienced actor, MC, TV host, go-to guy for various ethnic talent, musicians and producers, a busy guy. I mean, <laughs> you may have previously seen Bobby in one of his many televisions or film appearances hosting various corporate community events. Bobby sits on the board of directors of the Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce, the Real Asian Film Festival, the Punjabi International Film Festival, and is an honorary chair of the Road Hockey to Conquer Cancer in support of the Princess Margaret Foundation. A busy, busy person. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome to the stage, Bobby. I don't do that much in film or television. It's just a hobby of mine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for being here this morning. It's my uh, privilege and pleasure to um, uh, be here. Uh, I want to give you a quick background on myself. I think uh, Chris has done a, a pretty good job uh, introducing myself. Um, so uh, like a lot of uh, new grads uh, out of university, I graduated from the University of Waterloo. Uh, and uh, did what a lot of new grads do. I sat at home for the next six months trying to find a job and waiting for an employer to call me. That call didn't come for six to eight months and I finally got the call uh, from the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. Now the job that I had offered to me was in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada. Has anyone been to Sault Ste. Marie? Oh, their hands, okay, great. So I thought that Sault Ste. Marie was actually just past Barrie. I thought maybe it was an hour north of Barrie. I thought, great, I've got a great entry level marketing position uh, here. Uh, I'm gonna take this job and I'll just commute back and forth. Uh, so I get a call from them and say, well, we're gonna be sending you a plane ticket to come visit us. I said, plane ticket? Where is this place? So I, I, I checked it out and it's, it's about an eight hour drive uh, from Toronto. So. Long story short, I, I actually uh, went, took a visit up to Sault Ste. Marie, uh, took the job with them, not really knowing what I was getting into, but realized that I had to make the sacrifice. I had to embrace change, uh, and I had to take a chance. One of, the first, uh, one of the first roles that I had, or one of the first assignments that my boss at the time gave me was, Bobby, uh, I want you to drive around the city, uh, visit some lottery dealers, so the people that are selling lottery tickets, and, and just give me your observations. So I had two observations. Number one, the population of Sault Ste. Marie was 80,001. 80,000 was the non-visible minorities, and I was the one visible minority. <laughs> I'm pretty sure of it. Observation number two, I'm pretty sure it was the first time that many people there saw a person with a turban. This was maybe uh, a year after 9-11, I had a lot of um, apprehensions, a lot of fear uh, about moving to a city like this. But what I learned quickly was that the people there actually welcomed me with open arms because I was the first person that they ever met with the turban. And they had questions, they had curiosity, and they wanted me to answer those questions. So I had a fantastic time. Observation number three, and I think this was life-changing for me, in visiting a lot of the lottery dealers, I did notice that the ethnicity of these people that are selling lottery tickets was very different from what you see in the GTA. Not to be stereotypical, but a lot of the people that own variety stores and the shopkeepers in the GTA in southwestern Ontario all come from an ethnic background. That wasn't the case in Sault Ste. Marie. So the light bulb that went off for me was all the sales and marketing activity that's going on for this company is coming from Sault Ste. Marie. But in the GTA, most of the people that are selling and buying the tickets are of an ethnic background. Maybe there's a communication gap here. Maybe there's a little, uh, maybe we can do better in our sales and marketing efforts. So essentially what happened was I wrote a two-page summary of my findings, uh, of my, my drive around to St. Marie, and I presented it to my director at the time. 
And he was actually blown away because he had never thought, the company had never thought of anything like this. They never made that connection. Over the next two years, that two-page summary became a 60-page strategy document that I was leading. Keep in mind, I was fresh out of school, six months at home, wasn't able to find a job. And now I was leading a strategy initiative at the OLG. I was speaking at uh, sales and marketing rallies with over 100, 200 people, with corporate executives, talking to them about diversity and multicultural marketing and the need to close this gap in communication between consumers and dealers and the corporation. That's essentially how I got my start in multicultural marketing. Uh, from there, I, I, I left Sault Ste. Marie. I spent two years at ICICI Bank. ICICI Bank is India's second largest bank, and when they were expanding into Canada, they were looking for somebody that not only knew the Canadian population, uh, but could also work with uh, the Indian community and also an Indian team in Canada that was handling all the marketing. Very unique skill set, something hard to find, but that's something that I did for the next two years. And finally, I was headhunted into Rogers. I spent the bulk of my career there heading up multicultural marketing, everything from international television to wireless to home phone, so on and so forth. Uh, and today, I'm I, a partner in my own company, which is Ethnicity, uh, multicultural marketing and advertising. That being said, I have a confession to make. I'm not an immigrant. I was actually born and raised in Brantford, Ontario, Canada, and I'm not an internationally educated professional. But uh, I don't know if I can see the slides actually. I, I was on the cover of Canadian Immigrant Magazine because my wife is Australian, so I, I just managed to, to sneak in there with her. Um, so if I'm not an internationally educated professional and I'm not a new immigrant, why am I here? And as I was preparing my notes and, and wanted to come and speak to you, uh, two things that I did want to say. One was, I am the child of uh, immigrant parents. So I know a lot of you have come to this country not only for a better life for yourselves, but also for your children. Same reason that my parents came here. So I understand that struggle very well. So first of all, my thank you to you on behalf of your children, your future children, and the children of immigrant parents. Thank you for choosing Canada. You've made the right choice, first of all. So thank you. <clears throat> and number two, my personal thank you, as I'll, I'll get into this later, the reason I have a career in multicultural marketing is because of all of you and more immigrants that will come, continue to come to this country and build this country. I'll get into details of what myself and some other companies are doing, but you're actually fueling uh, a lot of growth in this, com uh, in this country. And I wanted to give you my personal thank you for that as well. So that's why I'm here uh, today. So I wanted to... Uh, oops. I wanted to pa paint a picture of three areas that I wanted to discuss with you. Firstly, I wanted to talk to you about Canada. Obviously, you all know Canada but I want you to see Canada from my perspective. And hopefully I can actually open your eyes and give you some ideas and how Canada is changing and how you can actually fill many gaps in this country by unleashing what I call your superpowers. I'll get into what your superpowers are a little bit later. I'll talk about what employers are looking for and why they need your superpowers. Lastly, we'll talk a little bit about um, how we can unleash those uh, superpowers as well. So I, uh, I wanted to, uh, I don't know how much time I have left, maybe 15 minutes or so. So I have a quick 15 minute video that we'll run through and then we'll take a couple questions and we'll be done. That was a joke. Um, it's, it's a one minute video, so I just wanna play this clip and we'll, uh, we'll chat in a second. So if you could roll the clip, please. Khan, this is the first look of my international production, Dr. Cabby. Enjoy the ride. Come on! Ma, Dr. Deepak Chopra, we are moving to the land of opportunity. Welcome to your new home. Huh? 
I graduated from a very well-respected medical school in India. Indian medical training isn't familiar to us. Maybe you'd like to try another career. Namaste. Hey, Mr. India. What do you do? I'm a doctor. Check one thing, doctor. <laughs> Small job, don't mind, don't mind. You're a cabbie like us. My water just broke. Trust me, I'm a doctor. No, you're a cabbie. Push! Ah! Let's take a look. You know why there's such a shortage of doctors in this country? That's all you guys are too busy driving cans. <laughs> Call me some hot chicks masala style. Deepu's never had a girlfriend before. My Deepu's in love. With a mom? How do you tell the difference between an oral thermometer and a rectal thermometer? The taste. Hi, my name is Amar. So the reason why I wanted to show that clip to you was really to demonstrate that Canada is changing. It's already changed and it's continuing to change. Are there any doctors, foreign trained doctors in the room here? This movie is about you. You're mainstream now. You're inspiring a new culture in Canada, essentially. That's what I'm trying to get at. The food we eat, the music we listen to, the clothes we wear, the people we vote for, what we play, the sports we watch, it's all being changed because of many people like you. You are the new mainstream of Canada. You're influencing culture in Canada, pop trends. The fact that a mainstream film can be inspired by really a social issue in Canada about uh, foreign trained doctors that can't find jobs and are forced to open medical clinics in their cabs. I'm not recommending that by any means, but the fact that this is a mainstream film that's happening, that's inspired by many people like you, this trend is only gonna continue to change. So that's why I want you to start looking at Canada a little bit differently. Now you've probably, I don't know if you've heard the numbers or not, but there's 20% of the Canadian population today is, uh, is new immigrants, or sorry, I can't even see. Sorry. Foreign born. Foreign born, thank you. Um, 250,000 new immigrants coming uh, to this country every year. So every four years, that's a million new people. That's a huge number. On top of that, you've got foreign trained uh, workers, you've got international students. I mean, that's why I'm calling you mainstream, right? I mean, we, we refer to a lot of uh, immigrants and, and, and people from overseas as, as being ethnic, but you're also mainstream as well, so I want you to, uh, to definitely remember that. Um, just in comparison, just to put in context, Canada versus uh, other countries, aside from Australia, there's really no other country like Canada on this planet in terms of the diversity that we do have. So you're in a very unique country, you're in a very unique place. This is a map of the, the GTA, basically. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the circle. You know, just for easy math, you're looking basically at about a 50-50 split in terms of visible minorities and non-visible minorities. And then you go into uh, the right-hand pie, and it, and it gives you a little bit more detail in terms of the ethnicities here. This is massive. You go into the suburbs. Look at Markham. Over 70% of Markham is now visible minorities. So again, my, my question is, is, is it a question of being the visible minority or is it the visible majority? You are mainstream. I want you guys to remember that. I want you guys to realize that. Same trend in Vancouver as well, very similar uh, in terms of the, the shift though of, of specific ethnicities, uh, slightly different, more uh, Chinese skewed versus South Asian. If you look at the languages spoken in, in all these different cities, um, Massive, what are these implications? What does this mean if, if these cities are speaking these languages in such massive proportions? What's that doing to the workforce? What does it mean? Like, what, what, I, I wonder what's going off in your heads. Are, are you getting any ideas right now? More cities, you'll see the languages as well. I mean, this is the snapshot of the new Canada, the Canada that I experience on a daily basis. This is a really interesting graph as well. If you think about the GTA, you know, we know that uh, certain pockets of, of the city um, are composed of various ethnic groups. Brampton, predominantly South Asian. Markham, predominantly Chinese. Woodbridge, predominantly Italian. 
But guess what? In those, in those uh, cities, English is actually the second language because of the prevalence of, of the other dialects that are being spoken there. English is a second language in these cities. What does that mean to employers today? What does that mean to the workforce? What does that mean for you, who I'm guessing speak a lot of these languages as well? The good news is this trend is only going to continue as well. Uh, our, our previous speaker got into this and basically talked about the labor shortage uh, in Canada. Essentially what this graph is, is saying is we're not having enough babies as Canadians. I've tried to do my part. I've had two babies in the last 15 months. I, ha I haven't had them. My wife had them, but I, I helped, of course. Uh, I don't recommend it in, in starting a new business, but it's been worth every minute. Uh, but I am doing my contributions. But uh, if we're not having enough babies, we've got to bring immigrants to this country to help the country grow. This trend is only going to continue. So you saw the stats about the cities being 50-50 splits, the prevalence of the languages. If these trends are only going to continue, what does that tell you about you folks and your skills and your special skills and employers? How should they be thinking about all this? And that's what I want to start thinking about now. And, and, I want you to start thinking about what are employers looking for and why do they need these superpowers? So again, the, the marketplace is absolutely shifting. We've seen it in the numbers and I've given you an example of, of pop culture now, a film that is being uh, produced and being released in mainstream and it's inspired by the stories of people like you. Obviously the workforce is changing as well. It's becoming very uh, diverse. And companies obviously have to innovate and stay ahead uh, because of these changes. There's implications for their businesses, things that they have to do differently. If they don't do these things, if they don't learn to change and accept these changes, chances are their competitors will be doing it or new businesses will be born. And that's where many immigrants, I believe the stat is about 50% of immigrants are entrepreneurs as well because they realize these gaps and they're able to fill these gaps with these special skills that they do have. Here's the proof as well. You've got economists that are basically forecasting that all future growth, now, now we're talking about dollars and cents. In terms of consumer spending, the Chinese and the South Asians are going to lead the way. What does that mean for employers? What is, what's going off in their heads? You know, you've got all these changes in, in languages, you've got the change in the marketplace, and now we even prove it that in spending, uh, this is all changing as well. So the way I look at it is, is immigrants come to this country with three types of luggage um, or baggage. One is your physical baggage. This is your, uh, your suitcases with your clothes and your belongings that you actually bring to the country. Uh, one is your emotional baggage. That would be obviously your, um, uh, your emotions, that you're bringing from back home, your ties to loved ones back home. You're obviously uh, bringing those feelings back here as well. And the third is what I call cultural baggage. Now, cultural baggage is actually quite interesting. Cultural baggage is, is your preferences, essentially. It's what you buy, what you don't buy, what you watch, where you shop, how you live. But these are also your unique insights that you're bringing, your unique education, your unique skills. These are all things that are coming to this country with you. I call it your cultural baggage. And that, my friends, is what I think is your superpower. And this is something that I don't think that any of you should be suppressing. It's something you should be celebrating. Because what you bring to the workforce with your superpowers differentiates you from any other potential job candidate out there. So these are things that need to be celebrated, especially with the shift in this country. These are the skills that you need to play up. They're desirable. My parents came here in the 70s. My mother has a master's in Hindi. My father has a master's in Punjabi. What were they going to do in the 70s with those degrees? You know, they, they did what they had to do to survive. Um, factory jobs, uh, opening up their own businesses, really doing what they had to do for survival. Fast forward to where we are today. Those two master's degrees are actually very valuable. The first thing that I did when my father retired, I actually opened up a business for him, which was a translation company. Because I wanted him to start doing translations for corporations and get paid some, some good bucks for doing it. Because that's a special skill that he's essentially suppressed for the last 30 years. 
It, it took 30 years for get, to get that skill out. Wish we had started earlier. But that's one of the first things I did. So that's what I would recommend to you as well. Don't suppress those skills. Be proud of them. Flaunt them. In, in case of the need, you know, these, again, from a corporate standpoint, everything that, uh, that you're bringing to this country in terms of community engagement, employee engagement, um, really dollars and cents at the end of the day, that's what it comes back to. That's what the companies are looking for as well. How are your unique skills going to contribute to our company? And at the end of the day, how are they going to make more money for us as well? But I'm here to tell you that these skills do contribute to enterprise value for all these corporations. And here's the proof, really. Here's what's happening in the marketplace. You've got CBC, who I believe is a sponsor here today, doing Hockey Night in Canada in Punjabi. An iconic Canadian brand, Hockey Night in Canada, being broadcast in Punjabi. I don't think you can get any more multicultural and mainstream than that. You've got banks that are looking at acquiring new customers by targeting newcomers. That's saying, hey, we understand your special needs and we want your business. So we're going to do what it takes to accommodate to your needs. You've got companies like Walmart that understand their customers so intricately that they've got products on the shelf to serve you. They've got people that can serve you in language. They're basically organizing their stores to reflect the communities that they serve. You've got companies like Rogers, where I spent most of my time um, bringing in foreign uh, international uh, television channels uh, to, to, to uh, meet the demands of the consumers. You've got companies like Home Depot that are doing in-language seminars in, in various pockets of the city, learn to paint your room for $99 in Mandarin or in Cantonese or in Punjabi or in Hindi. I mean, this is what's happening in corporate Canada today. These changes can't happen without the unique skills that you're bringing to the table. There's obviously somebody from the inside that's driving the change that you're seeing on the outside as well. So finally, I just want to talk about unleashing these, um, these special skills now and, and basically some observations that that I've had over the years. Um, you know, at the top, I, I thanked you all, obviously. You've, um, because of immigrants coming to this country, I've, able to ha I've been able to have a career in multicultural marketing, something that I don't even look at as a job. It's, it's really my passion. It's, it's what I love to do. And something that I've tried to do over the course of my career is actually help uh, newcomers, whether they're um, um, internationally educated professionals, whether they're international students, um, anytime somebody's reached out to me, I, I've, I've tried to do whatever I could to help them out. When, I, when I, I worked at the Toronto Star for a short period of time, and one of the things that I was actually known for was, at least on a weekly basis, to be sitting across the street on a park bench. And because over the course of the week, I would get emails or calls or messages on LinkedIn basically saying, Bobby, I got your name from this person, and they told me to come see you to talk to you. And I would give them whatever I could, 10, 15, 20 minutes, I would take my phone, my Blackberry with them. I would listen to them and I'd give them context. I'd give them any advice I could give them. I couldn't, I wish I had the power to give them a job, but I didn't, but I tried to help them however I could. And in, in speaking to those people, I've actually, you know, come to, to nine realizations that, um, you know, I shared with them and that I'll share with you and, and, and maybe they'll help you as well. One is, like I said, embrace change. I gave you that story at the top about me moving to Sault Ste. Marie and, and, and the fears that I had and the anxieties I had. If I didn't embrace that change, I really wouldn't have the career I have today in multicultural marketing. So take chances. Change is a good thing. And, and, and be, uh, be prepared to, to make multiple changes in your new life and your new career in Canada. Look for gaps in the marketplace. I also gave you the example of, of me driving around in Sault Ste. Marie, speaking to a lottery dealer and realizing that, wow, there's not a lot of diversity in this city. Is there an opportunity to fill a gap here? There's all sorts of gaps in the marketplace right now. You know, I've, I've given you the good examples of what companies are doing out there today to 
uh, engage ethnic communities. Um, but the truth is, there's still a big knowledge gap out there. A lot of corporations don't understand the superpowers you have. So you need to educate them on your superpowers. You need to look for these gaps in the marketplace and you need to be able to tell them that this is what you bring to the table and this is how you're going to fix their problems. That's where new opportunities uh, arise. It's really important to know yourself. You've got to know what you're good at. You've got to know what you're not good at as well. Those are two very important things. Again, the special skills that you bring, there's certain things that you might do today that you love to do, but you think, well, I'm in Canada now. I can't make any money doing this. There may be opportunities out there. Know yourself. Know who's out there that's willing to pay for your special skills. And, and like I said, if you can find this type of happy medium, you'll never work a day in your life. It, it, let your passion be your pension, that's what they say. It's great to be different. People, you know, I've seen people come to this country, you know, uh, whether it's changing their name to, to fit in or changing their appearance to fit in. Um, one thing that I've learned over the course of my life, and this is, again, I, I mean, I'll, I'll credit the Sault Ste. Marie for this. This is where I learned what my superpower was. was uh, I, 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 did a, I was speaking at a sales conference. Again, I was fresh out of university, very junior, presenting to these senior executives, and I finished, and it went very well. And I was speaking to, to my boss, and he said, you, you were amazing today. You did very well. And I jokingly said, um, oh, it's because I wear a turban. I mean, that was just a joke. And he, he said, you know, you might laugh at that, but I think that's your superpower. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people remember you because you look different. And they want to speak to you. Once they hear you speak, they want to continue to speak to you. And they remember your name. And that's something that a lot of people uh, don't have. Think about companies. Companies spend millions upon millions of dollars to differentiate their brand, to appear different from everybody else. So it's, an, it's okay to be different. Actually, it's something to be celebrated, something to be proud of. You're all a brand. If you take your name and add the word ink to the end of it, my name is Bobby Sani. If I say I'm Bobby Sani Inc., it changes a whole perception of who you are. Of course, in this digital age, in the social age, um, we've got to be aware that our brand is everywhere. So whether you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or Weibo or any of the other social networks out there, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be um, emitting the, the, the messages that you want people to see. Also keep in mind the cautious. There is what they call a digital footprint out there as well. So if you're posting things online that, whether they're comments or pictures or anything that, that may potentially put you in jeopardy of getting a job, um, those things follow you. you. You hand out a resume, the first thing an employer can do is Google your name and, and find out a lot of information about you. So just be aware of that. Social media is a very effective tool, again, in, in, in celebrating your personal brand. But you've got to do it responsibly and you've got to know how to do it. But it's a fantastic tool uh, to help you along the way. Unlearn. So when I worked at ICICI Bank, I, I worked with a lot, of, um, a lot of my colleagues that had come from India and a lot of uh, colleagues that were uh, Canadian or, or from Canada, uh, different ethnicities. And there was, also, uh, there was always a little bit of a cultural uh, gap, I think, in, in working with another, one another. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of coming with, with the cultural baggage, a lot of people uh, bring with them certain norms of working with uh, individuals and working with other people. I think in a country as diverse as this, it's, it's really important to understand that all of us are coming from different countries and all of us come from different um, norms. And what humor means to one group isn't humor to another group. And what being formal means to one group doesn't mean the same to another group. Even the concept of time. And I know a lot of the South Asian people, the Indian people know about Indian Standard Time, meaning it's okay to be a few minutes late here and there. There's other cultures that are very much time bound and time sensitive. And being on time means coming five minutes early. 
So it's important to know those type of norms as well and unlearn what you used to do and, and being able to work uh, collaboratively with your, uh, with your new colleagues. It's, I think it's very important to continue to invest in yourself. So whether it's education, whether it's training, whether it's new experiences, whether it's learning a new language, whether it's trying different types of foods or, or going to new neighborhoods, it's important to learn about our differences, especially in a country as diverse as this. I gave you the stats already. The trend is going to continue to shift. The more you can understand about the differences, the better off you'll be. I call those cultural competencies. So if you can sharpen the saw and learn these cultural competencies, you'll be ahead of the curve, definitely. I think this is really important as well, to think two steps ahead. And this is actually something that I learned in my own career. And any time I did take a, a job, um, I was actually thinking, okay, well, what is this job going to get me next? And, and the next, how am I going to get to where I really want to go? So a lot of you may not, um, you may not be getting uh, certain employment opportunities that are exactly what you want to do, but you've got to think about how is this going to get you to the next level and where you want to ultimately go. So it's important, I think, to uh, basically have a plan and be able to think um, a little bit more agile about how taking a position here or a job here, an opportunity here, can help you move to here and eventually get to where you want to go. And I think this is the most important thing that I've learned. Um, in my time when I was unemployed or, or even when I was employed, I, I, I've tried to give back however I could. Um, that means volunteer work. That means helping other people in need. Uh, that really just means help, just giving back to, to your community and your people. And what I found is that you, you always get rewarded one way or another. Um, it may not happen immediately, it could happen down the line, but there's many instances in my life that I can think of where I've lent a hand to somebody and then I've got it right back to me. Um, and, I, and I always tie that together as well. So if you are unemployed potentially at this point, uh, I would recommend doing some volunteer work, lending a hand, adding value to other people's lives. And if you are employed, I would recommend reaching out to those that aren't, helping them, giving them your time as well. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll be rewarded for your uh, efforts. Um, that's it for me, guys. Um, I, I hope I was able to, to shed some light on, on the new Canada, the way I see it, some of the gaps in the market, um, and, and really how you can unleash your superpowers and um, really add value to this country. Uh, so I invite you to keep in touch with me anytime, and, and thank you very much. I've been asked if there's any questions. I can uh, I can take those questions now at this time. Silence. No questions. Oh, we've got one. My question is about what do you think is the biggest barrier for immigrants in getting the first jobs? I'm in uh, particular interested in young immigrants. So can, can you speak a little louder? I just couldn't hear. Sorry, I thought that the microphone is, uh, is working. I'm interested, what do you think is the biggest barrier in getting first employment for, uh, per in particular, young immigrants? You know, again, I, uh, I've al I always put it back to knowing yourself very well. And, and I think that something that I've learned um, throughout my career and, and actually trying to help uh, other people find employment is a lot of people, um, you know, scatter resumes out there, you know, try and hope for the best, that type of thing. Um, but with, what a lot of employers want to see, and like I said, if, if you can recognize where there's certain gaps out there and how you can actually help to fill those gaps, 
um, a lot of the jobs out there aren't even posted. So it actually comes from uh, having an understand of, of your target company or the target industry that you're going after, knowing yourself and what you, what you can bring to the table, and then having meetings with the right people or, or networking with the right people to basically uh, be able to put yourself out there and say, look, this is how I can add value to you. It's, it's always about, w with anything in, in life, you've always got to think about, well, what's in it for the other person? We've got to stop thinking about ourselves and think about what's in it for the other person. I think a lot of times when, when we're looking for a job, we, we, wanna, we want that job. It's about us. We want that employment. But if you, if you turn it the other way and go into it thinking, I want to help this employer or this person with my skills, and this is what I can bring to the table, I think the conversation very quickly changes. And I th I, what I personally find is you, you have a lot more confidence in yourself as well. Um, because you're not, you, I think the ball's in your court then, basically. You call the shots because you've come to this person and this employer and, and you're saying, this is what I can bring to you and this is how I can really help you. And now it's up to you to, to take me or not. Thanks. Bobby, you've talked this morning about um, uh, how important it is to rebrand yourself and, and uh, think about your superpowers, and I, and I think that's a great message. One of the things that I, I always think, I teach uh, internationally trained professionals myself, and one of the, the frustrations that I see is that employers often don't get it. They don't get that there is a, a whole wealth of talent out there sure. with superpowers. I would love to see your multicultural marketing company be employed by the government to target employers as a, um, a marketing strategy because, you know, internationally trained professionals are out there, they're doing all they can, they're, they're, they're marketing their resumes, they're, they're thinking about their interview skills, but also I think employers have a responsibility too. So I would love to see the marketing community hit employers between the eyes and say, look, this is, this is what Canada has to offer. This is where the talent is. You know, it seems to all be on the responsibility of the internationally trained professional, but I do think that other areas might also be able to influence that. I absolutely agree. And I mean, I, di I didn't even tell you about our, our company, but I'll, I'll very quickly tell you that there's four divisions to our company, education and training, research and insights, strategy and planning, creative and execution. The education and training component of our company is really to do just that, mm -hmm. is to spend time with corporate Canada to wake them up. And that's literally what we're trying to do. Yes. We're, we're doing what we call wake-up sessions with, with CEOs of companies. We had, um, uh, last month, we brought the president of Louis Vuitton China. We brought him to Toronto, and we did a, uh, a function at the Toronto Board of Trade with 25 to 30 CEOs of top companies in the city. And basically the talk that he did was about understanding the Chinese consumer. So what he did was he, he, he basically woke up these the decision makers and said, look, this is what's happening back at home in China. But guess what? There's a lot of Chinese immigrants that are coming to Canada as well. So how are you using this data and this information to change your strategy? And people were blown away. We're, we're actually also, uh, beginning this fall, we'll be offering a course at the Schulich School of Business um, uh, Executive Learning Center on dis um, developing a strategic mindset when it comes to multicultural marketing. And our, our goal and our mandate is, like I said, to wake up corporate Canada, put immigrants to work, because those are special skills that are valued, that are necessary. Uh, and, and we want to we want to help lead that change uh, in this country as well. Thank you, that's Thank good you. to hear. Let's hope this trend continues. Thank you. One more question. Okay, I'll make it, uh, make it brief. Bobby, I really enjoyed your presentation about, about the, uh, you know, the superpowers and so on, but I, I was at one of these conferences not too long ago, maybe two years ago, and the keynote speaker talked about um, embracing the local culture, and uh, I wonder if that's a message that's sort of in transition itself because it doesn't seem to completely uh, jive with what you were saying about uh, you know, celebrating differences and all that sort of thing. 
No, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I said in, in sharpening, the sh sharpening the saw was that it's important to obviously know yourself, but it's also very important to know the other people around you as well. Uh, whether, it, whether you're in school or you're in the workforce or your neighbors, it's important to understand each other's culture as well. When you say the local culture, you know, I would argue that that local culture is actually quite heterogeneous and there is no one Canadian culture. This is the Canadian culture. Like I said many times, you are mainstream and you, you are, you're the new Canada, you're the new culture. I think I'll, I'll give you one very quick story. When I was doing my MBA and, and I was in Germany, the toughest assignment that I had was we were in a group of, of six people, um, one Canadian, myself, one American, three Germans, and one Russian. The assignment was to do a five-minute skit and make it funny. That was the assignment the professor did. I thought, I, I just paid a lot of money for my executive MBA and I'm doing a five-minute skit. That's, that's what I'm doing here. It took us six days to come up with a five-minute skit to make it funny. Reason why? What the Canadian thought was funny wasn't funny to the Russian. And what the Germans thought was funny wasn't funny to the American. So it's very important to understand these cross-cultural differences. And like I said, if these trends, trends are going to continue, it, it only becomes more important that we, we develop these cultural competencies. And to your point, understand the local culture, but also understanding that the local culture is really everybody else's culture as well.